running on Sunday means that your journey to this point has been really full of training. And being really full of training means the likelihood is you might have picked up one or maybe two little niggles. So as a show of hands, how many people are carrying a little niggle at the moment? So it's about half the group here, that's quite normal. How many of you have picked up that little niggle in the last three weeks? Okay, something you may have heard before, but this is maranoia. This is something where your brain is now playing tricks on you. Because if it wasn't there whilst you were doing a long uh, distance running, it probably isn't an injury. And as your body starts to relax and calm down, as you give it less training, it starts to scream at you and tell you things about your body that you didn't know existed. Because they don't. And maranoia is a really real thing. I'm a practicing physio and I treat hundreds of runners each month and the last three weeks for their big event they all come in with these crazy things so please for those of you I'm not mocking you I'm saying don't worry it's all going to be okay and you won't feel it on the day but what happens if you do feel something on the day this next 15 minutes of talk is going to take you through the six biggest problems that you might face on race day what I'm not doing is I'm not telling you how to fix an injury right now because it's too late. What I am doing is telling you the vital piece of information that you're going to need on race day if something were to go wrong, which we hope it doesn't. So we've got runner's knee. You've all just confessed to being runners and hopefully you own at least one knee each. So this way we know that this is going to be of interest. But one thing you might not know is I'm going to tell you why this coin pocket on this fashionable pair of jeans is the most important thing that you need to remember when we talk about runner's knee. When we're talking about the calf muscle down here on the back of the other leg, I'm going to tell you why you need to picture two chicken fillets and one slab of sirloin steak to get your head around the calf muscle. On the hamstring, I'm going to tell you why the fact you sit down all day at work and sit down to drive, well, hopefully you sit down to drive your car, otherwise that's a bit odd and illegal, uh, and the fact you sit down and you're eating and you're watching TV, why that is going to affect your hamstring, potentially on race day. The quads on the front of the leg, this is more for Tuesday morning, so I'm going to cover off Tuesday morning for you. The hip and the glute. The glute is the bottom, the back side, the arse. That's what we're going to be talking about. So when I say glute, know that I'm talking about this part. And the hip, we're talking about these muscles at the front here, the hip flexors. And lastly, why these muscles on the inside of your legs, called the adductors, are going to be possibly one of the biggest reasons why staying around for the next 14 minutes is going to make a big difference to the last four miles of your run. So, let's move on. Runner's knee. The knee joint is a pretty simple hinge joint. In fact, it's so simple that it's all controlled from up here at the hip. So when we talk about runner's knee, what we're talking about is that irritating kind of burning sensation on the outside of the knee. Most of you, or some of you, would have heard of ITB friction syndrome. The ITB stands for the iliotibial band that runs down the side of your leg and attaches just below your knee. And so lots of people, and I'm sure there's many in this audience today, have spent a lot of time foam rolling your IT band. Let me tell you something. That is very painful and achieves nothing. Okay, so apologies if you've been doing it. And I'll explain why. The IT band has a tensile strength of steel. I have a TV screen here in front of me, and this is all made of metal here. And I'm more likely to lengthen the television that I'm looking at with a foam roller than I am any of your IT bands. But don't worry, all is not lost. Remember the coin pocket I mentioned before. Under here is a muscle called tensor fasciolata, TFL for short. You can think of transport for London if that helps. You probably all got here like that. So underneath this pocket here is a little muscle that is the only contractile contortion outside of your glute muscle for that whole IT band. And by contractile, that means it contracts and relaxes. So we've got some movement there. So if you were going to try and affect the knee pain called ITB friction syndrome, you would foam roll this little part under your pocket. 
not all the way down the side of your leg, unless, of course, that's what you do for some giggles in your spare time, in which case, I did that for you young children there, by the way. Um, and, and, and I'm not judging you if you like pain, it's fine, but you're just not doing anything for your knee. So, what we need to think about is how we might stretch that on race day. So, a little bit of line dancing for you, I'm no country and western star, but if I was to stretch this TFL, remember Transport for London, to help with this knee, I would take that foot around the back until my little toes were touching. I would then push the hip this way, and I would lean that way. And if I lean back ever so slightly, I put a stretch onto this part here. Now the other thing about the IT band, I've said you can't foam roll it, you can't stretch it, it has no stretch receptors. So you won't feel a stretch down the side of your leg where you might think you would, you feel it just under your coin pocket. Now, doing this position on race day in the middle of the racetrack is frowned upon. So you want to go to the side and grab a railing and do it there. You can't do this whilst running because this is a running gait, it's not very effective. So make sure you go to the side and do that. So that's my first top tip. Remember TFL and remember to stretch like you're in, in a country and western musical show doing some line dancing. Now then, we're going to move right the way down now to the calf muscle. So if you look at a calf muscle from the back, you can see the shape that looks a bit like two chicken fillets. And sat just in front of that, closer to the shin, is a, a piece of muscle called the soleus, which is a bit like a slab of steak. So we need to consider all of that little meat feast. By the way, it's not a vegan friendly section to my talk, I apologise. This arrow should be pointing down here. I'm a physio, I can fix things, but I'm not very good at computers. So this should be down here. So if you use your gastronemus, the chicken fillets, they're one of the prime movers for you going forwards. So very, very important muscles. There's medial and lateral, there's two of them. And if they start to tighten up, because you become dehydrated or whatever, then you would stretch those with a straight leg. So leg straight, you bend the front leg and you go forwards. The slab of steak in front, you use that primarily when your knees are bent. So unless you run with completely straight knees, the soleus muscle is probably more important to you. And so you need to think about stretching that with bent knees. And it is literally like bending your knees. Think about yourself as Eddie the Eagle Edwards and you just landed from that ski jump. That's the right position. Hold that for 30 seconds and the lighter it is, it will alleviate enough to let you carry on running. So, a bent leg and a straight leg calf muscle. Now then, the hamstring. I told you earlier that sitting down all day at your job and driving to your job and then sitting down to eat, sitting down to watch the TV wasn't particularly good for your hamstrings. But let me quantify that. When you sit down, you stretch and potentially weaken through inactivity your main glute muscle. The main glute muscle is the major hip extensor. And what we need lots of in running is hip extension for us to go forwards. So because your glute through sitting down and becoming inactive is likely to be a little bit weak to do, wait for it, 50,000 steps to get from the start of the London Marathon to the end. That's 25,000 each bum cheek. There's a likelihood that your bum cheeks, having sat down for the last few years, are probably going to struggle to make it the distance. So what happens is the main hip extensor starts to get tired and a weak hip extensor, the hamstring, whose only real role in life is to bend the knee, does have a capacity to be a weak hip extensor, so it can take over. So in the last four or five miles of your marathon, maybe, just maybe, your hamstrings might start to tighten up and cause you a bit of problem. So, what you need to do, again, go to the side, frowned upon in the middle of the running track, and do a hamstring stretch. Now, I've searched Google Images on your behalf to try and find a good hamstring stretch and it doesn't exist because everybody shows you doing a stand-up hamstring stretch with a straight leg. Let me tell you a secret. There is no hamstring muscle in the back of your knee but if you stretch your hamstrings with a straight leg most of you will testify you feel it at the back of the knee when no hamstring exists. What you're feeling is a tension that you're putting through your sciatic nerve which runs down the back of the leg. And most of you would have heard of sciatica. And we don't want to put tension on the sciatic nerve. So everyone's been stretching their hamstrings wrong if all they've used is Google. 
So what you want is to have a bent knee, so you get yourself on a bent knee, toes pointing up in the air, and then you just bend forwards, and you'll feel the stretch in the belly of the muscle. This is the best thing to do. So go to the side, remember bent knee, toes up, lean forwards, and you'll put a nice stretch through your hamstring and you will not irritate the sciatic nerve. This is good information. A little bit too late, because race day is on Sunday, but it's good information. Now then, the quads. What I'm going to tell you about the quads is this is the perfect exercise to help you on Tuesday morning. How many people took Monday off work because they thought everything was going to be bad, right? Everyone has choices, you just make the right choice or the wrong choice. Tuesday was the day you should have taken off work because delayed onset muscle soreness takes at least 36 hours to get to the point where it's really agonizing. To the point where you're lying in bed and the weight of the duvet on your quads is too much to bear and you think, why on earth did I do this? And what will happen is, Monday and Tuesday morning, this is you going downstairs to make a cup of tea because you'll have to go down backwards you will not be able to support your own body weight on those quads. So what you need to do is whilst you're post-race and your friends are bringing over trays of Prosecco and pints of all sorts of other drinks are available, you want to be just every half an hour or so just doing a nice little quad stretch because otherwise Tuesday morning is going to be hell on earth. Now let's think about the quad stretch. You take hold of your foot and you put it up to your backside but look where the knee is. I see so many runners showing me their quad stretch where their knee is like this. The main quad goes over your hip and over your knee joint. So if you let your knee come forwards, I promise you, nothing is being stretched except for possibly a little bit of grey matter up here thinking, why am I not feeling this? You must bring the knee back in line with the straight leg, or even better, slightly past. Up, hips forwards to get that stretch. The purest form is lying on your front and pulling your, your heel up to your backside. But again, if you do that on race day, the rhino is going to run straight over the top of you, followed by the centipede, and you're going to struggle to finish the race. Now then, how many people, you're all a bit shy about putting your hands up this group, how many people are suffering with a little bit of backache uh, deep into their running time? It's like a Mexican wave coming across here. People are getting more brave. Um, the backache. When I, about 80% of the population, whether you're a runner or not, will end up with a significant bout of back pain at some point in their life, which will prevent them from going to work or doing the sport they want. This is not going to happen to you on Sunday. I'm just telling you, statistically, there's a very high chance you get back pain. I work with runners all the time in my clinic, and I can tell you that in almost every case, the back pain that runners are dealing with is because they've got very, very tight hip flexors and very weak and stupid glutes, which we talked about before. The hip flexor muscle originates from the lowest four vertebrae in the back, and it comes through and attaches onto your hip, and when it contracts, that happens. You get hip flexion, hence it gets its name. Now, the hip flexor muscle is incredibly strong, one of the most resilient muscles in the body, and you know what? We spend so much time with a muscle that's this long, sitting and making it this long, about half its normal length. And how many people spend nine hours a day at work sitting down and go, I really must get my run in, throw their trainers on, and expect their hip flexor to be able to do this about a thousand or two thousand times. It's a very common theme. So you shorten it, and then you want it to be long really, really quickly. The hip flexor is so strong, and your back in relation to the hip flexor is relatively weak. So what happens is your hip flexor gets tight, you start pulling your back into what we call lordosis, and the back starts to hurt. You then start altering your running style into something that enables you to keep going, and everything else starts to go wrong. So, if you start to feel an ache in your back, so much so you think, I just can't keep running, don't drop out, move to the side, and just do a nice big lunge stretch like this, where you push your hips forward. You'll feel a stretch on the front of your hip on both sides. It's exact. You should come and do the demonstration. That'd be brilliant. We've got a perfect stretch down here. Um, and you want to do that stretch at the side. To stretch out those hip flexors, your back will then get enough relief to enable you to run for another 30 or 40 minutes before you have to do it again. It's a brilliant thing to do on race day. Now then, the adductors. This is the golden nugget that you've all been waiting for, trust me. Because in your time running, in the training leading up to the marathon, you've been able to go in a straight line wherever you want. Nothing has got in the way. 
On race day, there'll be people who have entered and have the audacity to be slower than you at running. Or they put themselves in the wrong pen and they start off with a three hour lot and they should be back with a six hour lot. You're going to have people wearing rhino suits, centipedes, and not only that, people are going to grab the free Lucasade and the free water as they're running along. They're going to take half a sip and they're going to drop it on the floor, caring not a jot for those of you that are following on. So of course, across the course of your day, you're going to be like figure skating around these people. And you know what? The adductors, they didn't get the memo. You've been doing 30, 40, 50 miles a week doing this with your leg and doing none of this with your leg. So the adductors are completely unready for this. So for the next couple of days, make sure you're doing a gentle bit of stretching on your adductors. And if, if, with five miles to go, you've dodged so many slower runners and so many rhinoceroses and centipedes and water bottles that these are really starting to hurt. There's nothing wrong. Some of my clients say hello, but there's nothing wrong. We're going to the side and doing a nice little stretch. Yeah, I, I practice in Northumberland, which is 360 miles away. One of my beautiful clients here has turned up to listen to me. So she gets bored of me every week and still she turns up. This is good news. So the inductors, get back on, on course. This is what we need to be thinking about, people. Now, before I finish my talk, there's a couple of things. I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up about what to experience. And also, I have a 15 year old daughter who thinks she can beat me on Instagram followers. So there's my little thing down there. And you can help me with a competition at Physio and Therapy UK. No, but before I go, what I want to tell you is that on race day, you will have all sorts of things telling you that you need to stop running. And the major thing is the little chip part of your brain, if any of you have read the Steve Peters book, telling you that you're too old for this, you're too tall for this, you're too thin for this, you've got the wrong trainers on, of course it's hurting, why on earth did I agree to do this? And you have to ignore that little person on your shoulder because your body will want you to stop. What I want to do is explain to you that it's okay if you do need to stop, but keep moving. One of the problems is, most of your training, unless you practice the run more program, you won't have practiced stopping. So your body, every time you stop running, has decided, oh, thank God, that brilliant, it's over, I don't need to do this anymore, and rigor mortis sets in, and your body starts to tighten up and recover. What you need to do is understand that on race day, you don't want that to happen at mile 14 or mile 16. So if you see Aunt Rosie at the side and she's got some Haribo, by all means go and say hello, but keep your legs moving. Don't let your brain think you've stopped. And if you do need to go to the side and do one of my stretches that I've just taught you, then do it, but do it quickly. Get over to the side, 30 seconds, and then try and get walking and back into a run as soon as possible. Don't let rigor mortis set in. People, this has been your build-up, your journey to get to the start line on Sunday. And I'm just so proud to play a tiny little part in that journey. Two things. One is, there's 26.2, forget the point two for a minute, 26 miles that you're going to be running. There will be 26 people that have been significant to your journey, or 26 people that you know. If not, turn around and find 25 people around you at this talk. But think about a different person every single mile. And imagine that if you stopped that person standing over you, calling you a loser. No, imagine that person <laughs> being motivating for you to keep you going. It's really important that you think of things. The other thing is, the crowds will be pushing you along. If you've got your name on the front, they'll be shouting your name out. And all of that information coming into you is gonna be a fantastic way of driving you across the line. So use the crowds. Use the people in your brain. Have an absolutely wonderful time. Everyone wave at Johnny Quint from Socony at the back there as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, I'm going to be going over to Bloomsbury to help you buy my book. And to, if anyone's got a last minute injury worries, come and find me there and I'll talk you through it, do the best I can. As I said, you need to follow me on Instagram. My name's Paul Hobart. I'm available for weddings, funerals and bar mitzvahs. Good luck everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>